So the story of how I ended up in the Gobi was a little bit of a sort of random and coincidence played a part in it. I was living in Nepal until May this year. I actually went to see a doctor in Nepal in, in May and um, was an amazing doctor. He, li he listened to my chest and then said I should probably come back and have a ultrasound. And being a cynic, my automatic reaction was that this was an unnecessary test that they were trying to charge the foreigner for. But uh, I thought, well, you know, he seems like a, a nice guy. I'll, I'll come back tomorrow and have an ultrasound done. And I did that and he looked a little bit shocked and said, you've got a very large hole in your heart that you've had since birth. And um, this wasn't exactly what I was expecting to hear. So then in March this year, I had open heart surgery. And it was about a three month of recovery from that. It was about a week in, a couple of days in intensive care, a week in hospital, and then three months of, of recovery for the sternum where they break the bone to go in. So in June, I started running again. And then I got a call from a guy out here saying there's a big race happening in the Gobi. Uh, would you like to come and run it? Or would you like to come and attend as a journalist and or running it? And so I thought, well, I'll try and do both. So I didn't have a great deal of time for training, but it, it seemed like the perfect opportunity to bounce back from surgery to take on a, a challenge like this. The, the reality really hits when you've done one kilometre and uh, you're beginning to sweat and your body's beginning to come to the realisation that what you've been doing for the last 10 minutes, you've got about another 90 hours of it. For the first part, I was just focusing on getting to 160 kilometres. So I knew that was the furthest I'd ever run, so I knew I could go that far. And then whatever comes after that, I thought I'll, I'll cross that bridge when I, when I get there. Well, I didn't actually have very much running kit, and so I pretty much bought all I had. But I normally just run in cotton shirts. I normally run without socks, so I had to bring all the running socks I, I own, and some ski socks and various other things. But yeah, I did the cotton shirts fine. I mean, again, it's a bit like the nutrition. I mean, there's some good stuff out there, but a lot of it is slightly over overcomplicated. I mean, I always just focus on the next milestone whether that's a checkpoint, a rest station, a particular, you know, round number in the distance. Yeah, I was running with Chalkin and Harvey for a while, and then to be honest, they were both very unlucky to, to drop back. In Harvey's case, it was his stomach, and in Chalkin, it was his inability to navigate. I was accidentally the leader of the race, rather than, <laughs> rather than it being intentional or something that I'd, I'd striven for. The hill was tough, but actually the hardest thing was the other side of the hill, because it's, it's always like one of these psychological things, you focus on getting to the top of the hill, but you're also telling your mind that once you get over the top, it's going to be easy. And in fact, getting up the hill was a little bit of a strain on the legs, but the 80, 100 kilometers the other side of the hill were really brutal, they were the hardest train of the whole thing. That was pretty tough realising that it wasn't all downhill from here and just because it looked flat on the map doesn't mean you weren't going to be scrambling in and out of canyons or scrambling over sand dunes or doing some things which were really quite brutal on the feet and the legs. When you walk in the desert during the night it's, um, uh, it can be a little bit of a surreal experience. It, uh, it can be a bit lonely but it's, it's a nice feeling. It's, it's, it's hard to describe but uh, yeah you think about a lot of stuff and Mainly you think about getting to where you're going, <laughs> but uh, I enjoyed it. I was really amazed by how the lack of sleep was manageable. I ended up with about five hours in total, so I had uh, two hours on the first night, uh, one hour on the second night, two hours at rest station nine before pushing on for the last 100 kilometers. Walking through the last night, I would say, was for me the darkest or the lowest point in the race. I could feel myself injuring myself with each step. You know, I could feel my bag rubbing, I could feel my ankle getting more and more swollen, I could feel my feet blistering. And it's a point like that when you 
when you actually realize what we're effectively doing, which is just self-harm. You know, at that point, there's nothing, there's nothing healthy about it. There's nothing um, great or, or glamorous about what we're trying to achieve. At that point, it just boils down to self-flagellation, damaging your body. But you've come this far and you've set yourself a particular target of, of getting somewhere and so you, you feel like you should finish it off, which is a bit, of, a bit illogical, really. But um, I guess it's, it's all part of the process. I'm better at thinking about why people run in general than thinking about why I personally run. I do think there's a degree of addiction involved in there. But I think, I think it's quite a human process of wanting to, to push yourself to a physical limit. And I think we're the only people who are actually doing th these things to ourselves voluntarily. It seems like life has to become quite comfortable before people start paying to make it uncomfortable again. I do enjoy the races while I go on. Anyone who pretends to enjoy all of it is uh, probably being economical with the truth because I don't think anyone can enjoy their lowest moment of a race like that. I do get a great satisfaction at the end of a race and in the days afterwards when I, I think that I've, I've achieved something. Uh, something that's pointless and arbitrary and completely unnecessary, but something that, you know, I push, push to a certain limit.